This is the first Sunday of Advent. And last year we did this for the very first time. And so, hi to honey. Where are you going? <laughs> As I was saying, it's the first Sunday of Advent. Um, and this morning we light the candle of hope. And I'm going to read to you from Isaiah uh, 2 through 6. It says, the people who are walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have scattered, shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, and the govern uh, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say with pride and arrogance of heart. Amen. Thank you, Elena, and thank you for bringing the word last week. Um, Eric, yes, Eric and I enjoyed uh, being off and had all of our family uh, home and three new babies, which I'll show you a picture of them a little bit later in the message. Uh, just happens to go along with the message. Um, but uh, I am so, so blessed what God has built here. The, the leadership team, uh, all of you that just fall right into place and come and support and just make things happen because he's the one that makes it happen, right? We just, say, we just say yes to him. So I hope you can feel uh, the Holy Spirit here today. He's in this place. He, he met us here. He met us here. We cover uh, this, his temple, with prayer all through the week. And prayer is, and the word is heavy on, on my heart. So today, uh, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you, God. I ask that you would just take over in these next few minutes, Lord. Speak your word. Speak your way. Lord, help our ears to be open to what you have for us today. We give you all praise. We give you all glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. This morning, uh, my title is, Come, Lord Jesus. My hope is in you. First week of Advent is hope. Everything changes when we see the face of God. One of my favorite quotes from Pr Priscilla Schreier, because I have found it to be so true, is this. If I was your enemy, I'd seek to dim your passion, dull your interest in spiritual things, dampen your belief in God's ability and his personal concern for you, and convince you that the hope you've lost is never coming back. And it was probably a lie to begin with. All lies from the enemy. Brene Brown says, we need hope like we need air. To live without hope is suffocating. Our Advent prayer is, come, Lord Jesus, come. My hope is in you. I'm going to share a story, Katiana's story from Israel. Uh, there's a slide where you can find it 
um, on YouTube or complete testimony um, of the invasion on October 7th in Israel. Uh, she was interviewed by her pastor, and he calls her a woman of prayer. And when she understood the magnitude that was happening on October 7th, she started to pray to Yeshua, God Almighty, and a miracle happened. So just a few of her things. October 7th, Katiana and her family woke up to the sounds of explosions and gunfire, and they lived in a kibbutz. It's a gathering of homes that are together based on agriculture. So here they were living, and people asked, why would you live there in that kibbutz settled right on the border of Gaza? They'd lived there for over 22 years, and she said, I only have one answer. God brought us here. We've seen many miracles in the last 22 years as we've got to visit, uh, witness to the people in Gaza. The, the kibbutz has a WhatsApp chat, and um, when she, the terrorists were coming in, she pulled up her phone, and uh, messages were starting to fly back and forth. She and her husband went to their bomb shelter room, and um, she put on the app that they were under attack, and the believers, she is a Messianic Jew, the believers immediately started praying. They were the first to respond. She says that she stood in the middle of her room, their bomb shelter room, and she raised her hands, and she said, Yeshua, Yeshua, God Almighty, we need your help, we need your protection, and their prayers just started flowing as she raised her hands, calling for mercy and for protection for her people and for her family. She said she knew there was only 11 soldiers, and she could tell uh, um, that were guarding the Herka boots, but they would soon be overran. And she said she prayed for God to send his army. So her oldest son, Danny, was at the music festival with the 5,000 people. He and his friends were surrounded by the thousands of terrorists with an absolute massacre. She said, I know God. I know, Yeshua, you are with him. My son is your warrior. Katiana says she had a supernatural peace during all this time in her heart. The Lord gave her son Daniel wisdom. Those who ran were shot or massacred or taken hostage, but he and his friends went into the forest and they found a low spot in the forest and they laid there for the next 13 hours. She was talking to him on the phone and she could hear his whispers and she could hear all the chaos in the background and then she lost connection with him. She trusted God for him. Meanwhile, back at her house, she sees on her security camera, she's watching on her phone, that the terrorists are entering her own house. But she senses God is in this battle. She said, Lord, we are in your hands. Her husband covers her with his body. They are thinking this is their last moments on earth. And this is what is really amazing about her testimony. She grabs her phone and she whispers an audible. She said, she said, they are inside our house. Let's all pray together. Get right with the Lord. So that is it. if this is the end, we will all go together to Yeshua. She is thanking and praising God in that very moment, encouraging others to come to salvation. Their kibbutz was completely taken, but God was there. She wondered how could they fear if they are the children of God. She was reciting the psalm that she's recited many times in the last 22 years for protection. She said, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. She can hear the terrorists going through her house, breaking things. They are, they are in coming near the bomb shelter room where her and her husband are. They stop. She sees them on the camera. She's preparing herself to be it for to be door to be broken into. But they didn't stop, they did not touch the door. Suddenly they stopped shouting. They stopped breaking things. They just stood right there at the door. But they never reached out and touched the handle. They just stood there, and then they went 
forward some more. She said, usually, when the terrorists come, they throw a grenade in the house. They shoot through the bomb shelter doors. However, here, they just stood at the door and didn't touch it. They could not even see it. They passed by the door. They went on to where her son, Jonathan, another son, and his son, a grandson, were hiding. But once again, she could see in her camera on her security footage, they stopped in front of his door. She's waiting. And again, they did not touch the door, but kept on going. It reminds us of Genesis 19.11, when the angels first pulled Lot inside when the mob was attacking him. Genesis 19.11 says the angels supernaturally struck the men who were at the door with blindness so they could not find the door. And this is the miracle that Katiana and her family had and witnessed this day of October 7th. We serve a miracle working God. Amen. <laughs> Yeshua, in desperate times, we can call on the name of Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. My hope is in you. Today, we stand in the gateway of the Advent season. And we pray, and I pray that the authentic thrill of Advent would be yours today, that you would catch hold of the spirit, the expectancy that he is coming again. He came once, but he's coming again. The advent, the glory of the Lord is coming. The breaking of divine into human history. The supernatural into the natural. At times, life is much harder than we could ever imagine. Amen. At times, it feels like God has forgotten to be gracious to us. In times of great darkness, God promises that we can call on the name of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. My hope is in you. Elena read the scriptures for today, and I'm going to just read back uh, verse 2 and verse 6 of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Verse 2, the people were walking in darkness. They have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And verse 6, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Amen. He is both wonderful counselor, mighty God, and the message of hope was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. The establishment of his eternal kingdom. The child who would become their deliverer, their Messiah, Jesus Christ. The Apostle John also referred to the, as Jesus as the true light in John 1.9. He said a true light that gives light to everyone was coming to the world. And Jesus referred to himself as the light of the world in John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whenever we see the Christmas lights this season, let them remind us of the light of Jesus Christ. Train your heart to seek the light of Christ by noticing all the lights around you. Everything from the sunrise to the setting of the sun and maybe even the little light in the back of the refrigerator. That's the <laughs> challenge. Those red lights are the parking, the car in front of you at the stoplight or the stop sign. Let those bright lights remind you of the light of the season, his light. He is our hope. Bethlehem was just the beginning. Jesus was promising a repeat performance. He's promised to come again. We could call it Bethlehem Act Two. <laughs> However, it's not going to be silent and it's not going to be at night. He is going to come. The skies will open, trumpets will sound, and a new 
kingdom will begin. Amen? Amen. He will empty the tombs and wipe away every tear. Be gone sorrow. Be gone sickness. Wheelchairs and cancer. Enough of you screams of horror. Death, you die. Life, you live. The manger invites, even dares us to believe the best is yet to come. Just bring a baby into the room, and this is where I'm going to show you ours. <laughs> the Blevins babies. So this was us last week. They're uh, just about seven or less than two months apart from each other. Uh, the little guy on the, on the bottom is, was nine days old. And uh, there were a couple months, and then Elise in the middle with that beautiful hair. She's the only girl. So when a baby comes into the room, right, it changes everything. We, oh, our arms come open. Let me hold them. We had a couch, and it was fun. We took picture after picture. Who was going to hold the three babies on the couch this time? And who would hold which baby? <laughs> but our arms come open, and that was a reminder of what Christmas is. The, the baby that comes, he changes everything. The conversation shifts from perhaps politics to pacifiers and uh, pampers, you know. Uh, this time of year, babies take center stage, and they should, because they are a gift from God. And they remind us that he came as that ch first child. Mary's eyes fell upon the little face and I wondered if she whispered so this is what God looks like everything changes when we see the face of God people have always wondered what the image of God was like he they depicted him as a golden calf a violent wind an angry volcano but never in man's kind wildest imagination did we ever consider that he would enter the world as an infant. John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Not a whirlwind or a devouring fire, but a single cell, <laughs> a fertilized egg, an embryo, a baby. God became flesh. Jesus entered our world not like a human, but as a human. Do you ever wonder, what was his favorite food? <laughs> did he have a pet? <laughs> did he get in trouble? <laughs> the question begs, why did God go so far as to become human? And one of the biggest reasons is he wants you to know he understands exactly what is happening in your life. He's been there. He can feel what you feel. He faced what you face. Does God care if I'm sad? Well, look at Jesus' tear-stained face as he stood near Lazarus' tomb. Does God notice when I'm afraid? Oh, yes. Do you remember him marching through the storm to rescue his friends on the sea? Does God know if I'm ignored or rejected? We have to look at the compassionate eyes of when he restores those forgiven, those diseased, those he heals. Jesus himself stated, and anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone who's seen me weep has seen the Father weep. Anyone who has seen me laugh has seen the Father laugh. Anyone has seen me determined has seen my father determined. Would you like to see the face of God? Then look at Jesus. Everything changes when we see the face of God. Come, Lord Jesus. My hope is in you. Amen? Because of Bethlehem, I have a Savior in heaven. Christmas begins what Easter celebrates. The child in the cradle becomes the king on the cross. Because of Bethlehem, love is here. Hope is born. Everything changes 
when we see the face of God. There's a story that happened in 1926. George Harley founded a medical mission among the Mano tribe in Liberia. The locals were receptive to the doctor and helped him construct a clinic and a chapel. Eventually, Harley treated more than 10,000 patients a year. But during the first five years, not one person of the tribe came and visited his chapel. Shortly after the doctor and his wife arrived to Liberia, she gave birth to their first child, Robert, their son. He grew up on the edge of the forest. He was the apple of our eye, Harley said. How we loved our little boy. But one day when he was almost five years old, I looked out the window and saw Bobby. He was running, but then he fell down. He got up and he ran some more and he fell down again. But this time, he didn't get up. The doctor ran across the field to pick up his little boy. And when he got there, he realized that he was feverish. He held him in his arm and he said, Bobby, don't worry. Bobby, don't worry. Your daddy, your daddy knows how to treat this tropical fever. He's going to help you. Your daddy's going to help you. Dr. Harley tried every treatment he knew, but nothing helped. The fever raged. And in short order, the disease took the little boy's life. The parents were distraught with grief. The missionary went to his workshop and built a coffin. He placed Robert inside and nailed the lid. He lifted the coffin on his shoulder and walked across to find a clearing to bury his son. One of the old men in the village saw him and asked about the box. When Harley explained that his son had died, the old man offered to carry, help him carry the coffin. Dr. Harley told a friend what happened next in his own words. So the old man took one end of the coffin and I took the other. Eventually we came to the clearing in the forest. We dug a grave there and laid Bobby in it. And when we covered up the grave, I just couldn't stand it any longer. I fell on my knees in the dirt and to began to sob uncontrollably. My beloved son was dead. There in the middle of the African jungle, 8,000 miles from home and all my relatives, I felt so alone. But when I started crying, the old man just cocked his head and looked at me with stunned amazement. He squatted down to look at me and looked very intently for such a long time, listening to me cry. Then suddenly he leaped up and went running down the trail through the jungle, screaming again and again at the top of his voice, white man, white man, he cries like one of us. That evening, Harley and his wife grieved. There was a knock on the door. Harley opened it. There stood the chief and almost every man, woman, and child of the village. And they were back again the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday. The chapel was full to overflowing. They wanted to hear about Jesus. Everything changed when the villagers saw the tears of the missionary. Everything changes when we see the face of God. He came with tears too. He knows the burden of a broken heart. He knows the sorrow. Our Lord and Savior knows the sorrow of our hearts. He took your face in the hope that you would see his. One year, I did not hang a single Christmas decoration. I was grieving the loss of everything I thought that was good and right. I did not have one ounce of energy to celebrate the season. If this year broke you, if this year you feel like the man laying at the doors of the church in Pueblo, finding refuge 
at the doors of the church. If, if you feel that 2023 has isolated you, left you grieving, fearful, or hurt, I want you to know you don't have to muster up cheer. You don't have to feel like you are ruining anyone's part of your celebration. You can just sit at the feet of the Savior who came for you right where you are. That's how Emmanuel works. God is with us. Amen. He sits with us. He sits with us in the dirt, giving us hope in the face of despair. That year I was grieving, my friend would not let me go down on her watch. She bought me this little word art picture. She said, you need at least one tree. It's going to come. That was the picture that she got me, my one tree. She was right. I hung it on my wall, and it still hangs there today, all year long. Not only did I need it that season, but I need him every season. Come, Lord Jesus. My hope is in you. <laughs> this is why we're going to offer Surviving the Holidays on December 16th, the Candlelight Holiday Memorial Service, allowing opportunity to God, for God to bring comfort for those who are grieving, to discover there is hope for their future. I've been stirred recently more than usual for the reading of word and for prayer. I came across an account of Pastor Jean Roncone, who is our network superintendent, and he was sharing a time where they were about ready to move into their new building. And he, he said, oh, I want to cover this place in prayer and the word of God for two weeks before we even have a service in the building. He was recalling the books of Nehemiah and Ezra as they record a deep moving of God's spirit on the people and the community of faith when the word of God was read in entirety. So they took 72 people who took 60-minute shifts to read through the entire Bible in 72 hours. Imagine walking into the very first worship service, knowing that every verse, chapter, and book from Genesis to Revelation had been read from the pulpit. How I would love to do that here at PCW. Every verse, every chapter, every book read from this pulpit, when you, the, the, the echoes of the scripture through the walls as we are here, when you pray, there's no better place to start than the word of God. And this is the heart of our prayer reading challenge. We're, we are going to read through the entire Bible in 2024, and I hope each one of you will join us. And it's not just for the sake of saying we've read through the Bible this year, because it's the word of God is alive and active and a powerful guide to our life and to prayer. So some of the samples there on the back, we have a large print, we have New Living, we have New King James. And if we sell all of those, they're $15, that just covers the cost. I can order more, write down what you would like. But each day, it tells January 1st, and it tells you exactly what you need to read. That way, if you miss a day, you know, oh, I got to go to January 3rd. I missed the second. But you can, Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. So join us, if you will. Because research shows if a person engages with the Bible four times a week or more, they're less likely to give in to temptations. Drinking, pornography, lashing out in anger, gossiping, lying, all the bad habits and hang-ups that we carry with us, they significantly decrease if we find time in the Word. Those who engage in Scripture four times a week or more are less likely to feel that God is distant or far away. 
Reading God's word has a greater spiritual impact than any other discipline. Not only do we need to read God's word, we need to be able to pray God's word. And that's why on January 20th, Elena will lead us, and Laney will lead us through adding the colored tabs through our Bible through different subjects. So if we want to pray through uh, the favor of God or through anxiety or whatever we might be going through, we can go to that colored tab and immediately find the scripture that will help us pray our need. What do you need to gather up before January 20th? It's back there as a sample, a compact Bible, highlighters, colored tabs. But I hope your heart is being stirred like mine for prayer and to get in the word of God. Do you remember how Daniel's enemies in the book of Daniel, when we studied earlier, how they tried to keep him from praying? And what was Daniel's response? Did he stop praying? <laughs> No, he just kept doing what he always did. He went to his altar in the window and he prayed. No law or scheme could keep Daniel from praying. Not even threats against his life. Nothing was more important to Daniel than prayer. And why is Satan so tempted to oppose prayer? At times we may feel as though our prayers are not answered. But Satan doesn't share that opinion. Satan wants to keep us from praying because he knows how much prayer matters, probably even more than we realize ourselves. Satan fears prayer because pre prayer moves the unseen. It's no surprise that he will use every tactic, every distraction to keep us from praying. Satan seeks to silence our prayers, keep our mouths shut, our knees unbent. It was true in Daniel's day, and it's true this day. Private prayer may be permitted today. Probably more often people go, sure, go ahead, go ahead and pray. Although it's often ridiculed and usually neglected. But public prayer is attacked. The Barna Group has re reported that one of the that of the Americans who do pray, only two percent pray audibly with another person or group, and only two percent participate in prayer with their church. And I think that holds true of our Tuesday night prayer. Daniel could have stepped away from his window, and no one would have known. But what got Daniel in trouble was his refusal to not pray, to give up public prayer. He would not hide what he was doing. When prayer gets reduced to only a private or personal matter, we limit it. We limit the ability of the believer and how to pray. People are left to figure it out on their own. We may talk about prayer, but we rarely pray. And if we're not careful, we gradually lose our knowledge and passion for prayer. Prayer is something we must be willing to learn and do, something we must continue to grow in. Come, Lord Jesus, my hope is in you. I have a story of Amanda Benedict in 1911. She was hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She heard that the Spirit of God had fallen on a small church in Springfield, Missouri. She walked miles to get there, and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. After that, the Lord gave her a great burden for the lost, those around, and she prayed for God to do a mighty work in Springfield, Missouri. She committed herself to fast and pray. She only drank water and ate bread for an entire year, crying out for God pleading on her face in a grove of trees. She would recite the promise of God, believing that God would do a great work in Springfield. And yes, indeed, sometime later, that grove of trees became the worship center of the first Pentecostal church in Springfield, Missouri. 
Amanda Benedict represents the thousands of intercessory prayer warriors that pray and fast for God to do a mighty work. God works through the intercession of his people. The prayer and the fasting, we must not uh, neglect as something that has happened only in the past. We must keep it current and growing. We want to keep the spirit of Amanda Benedict president, uh, present and alive and represented the spirit of the almighty God as he empowers his people. How desperate are we? How desperate are you for your loved one? How desperate are you to feel God like you used to know him? How desperate are you? Do you really mean it when you say hope goes here? Hope goes here. I can't change a life, and certainly neither can you. We can't argue. We can argue. We can plead. We can throw a fit for someone to listen. Change your mind. Come on. Come on. Come to God. But it won't help. It will do no good. But if we pray, if we pray, if we intercede, if we ask God to have mercy and grace, on the lost, God can soften the heart of stone. D.L. Moody said, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. We say we want a mighty move of God. We need to learn to pray. Come, Lord Jesus, my hope is in you. There's a a book that's out. It's called In the Name, In Jesus' Name. It's by Rick DuBose. He is the Assistant Superintendent of Assemblies of God. It's a wonderful book I would recommend. Uh, he had a vision when he was 20 years old. And, um, I'd love to read it to you, but um, I won't take the time today. But God, he dropped to his knees and God gave him a vision. He said it wasn't so much as a vision as a moment of realization. In that moment, what men like John, Isaiah, and Ezekiel had long described was his as well. He was given an experience to the throne room above. He went on to the throne room. He said he could sense, there was no sense of fear, but a sense of awe that leaves you quiet. And still, he said, it is right that God is worshipped. He went on and saw the circle of thrones, as mentioned in Revelation 4, the seats of 24 elders, 12 for the disciples and 12 for the tribes of Israel. Above those thrones, the four cherubim were flying and singing their praise. Holy, holy, holy. It echoed through the heavens and the circle of thrones, thorn, thrones. Rick described the earth as a sea of glass, and this was one of the most interesting parts. He said the details he remembers so clearly. It was what scripture calls a sea of glass in Rebel, Revelation 4, 6. Within the ring of the thrones was a massive sur surface that appeared like clear glass. He said the closer he looked, however, beneath the glass, the earth was stretched out and it was entirely visible at once. He said, we all know the earth is round, and it rotates on an axis. But he says, in this heavenly realm, it was visible all at once. The whole earth was laid out at the throne of God, encircled by the thrones of the elder, elders. All of heaven peered down through the glass floor, and the earth as always before him, the earth, the whole earth is always before God when he looks down from his throne. He said he saw many times, he saw every island, every nation, every city, every people. It was all before God. God's feet rested on the glass sea, on this image of creation. And immediately Rick remembered the words spoken to Isaiah, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. 
and this intercession of Jesus. He said, across the glassy image of the earth, Jesus was walking. And as he walked, the image of the earth began to move under him. And with each step Jesus took, the world shifted. Cities and lights and nations burst into light. And perhaps it was what John described as he saw Jesus walking among the candlesticks in Revelation 2. He said, I had the distinct impression that Jesus was still doing the same, walking now among the churches, spread all over the globe, each church burning brightly on the earth. Not only did the earth shift beneath his feet, but as he zoomed in and focused on the cities, streets, and individual homes, then I heard Jesus praying as he walked. As the earth moved, he was interceding, Jesus was interceding for us. Each place he stood, Jesus turned to face the throne of God and prayed for those that were beneath him. The prayers of earth were rising up to Jesus, and he was amplifying them before God. How many times have I prayed in Jesus' name and not truly realized what I was participating in? I had long been the way of uh, concluding my prayers, However, now I understand the real power of what I say. It's not just the formality of we sign the letter sincerely, but when we pray in the name of Jesus, we're offering up prayers into the throne room, and then Jesus intensifies them and magnifies them to our Heavenly Father. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful concept. Our prayers are not just in some heavenly queue waiting for our turn. No, Jesus prays them all. They all rise up to him. He amplifies them to the Father on the throne. He said the balcony of the saints, this is, the, I love this part too. He, encircling the throne room was a great balcony, a mezzanine filled with saints peering down and watching the movement and action below. From their vantage point, they could see witnesses and, and how the activity of heaven was directly connected with the activity on earth. They saw the throne room and down to, into creation. They're witnessing the prayers of the earth and divine responses. I began to understand the power of the witnesses in ways I hadn't before. They were not only witnessing the work of God had done in their own lives, but they were positioned in heaven. They were witnessing the work of God across all time in creation. I watched as saints were individually called forward by name to the front of the balcony. They were being invited to witness something unique to just that person. I realized that these saints had died with prayers that had not yet been fulfilled in their lifetime. But those prayers remained in heaven. They were being called forward to see their prayers answered. The fulfillment of hours of petitioning heaven. No prayer had been ignored. No prayer had been lost. No prayer had been forgotten. Their prayers were waiting in the throne room until the sovereign moment. And then, by God's calling, they were now able to watch them be fulfilled. Grandparents who were witnessing their grandchildren they prayed for until they died finally received salvation. They were witnessing the marriages of their children finally being restored. Saints were witnessing fresh revivals poured out on the churches they long served and had long prayed for. Nations were being transformed before the eyes of those who had given their lives in those places. Having not seen the fruit of their prayers while they were alive, they now witnessed from this heavenly vantage point. As they witnessed it, they worshipped. They declared the goodness and faithfulness of God. At this balcony of saints grew worship. It echoed louder and louder, ascending the whole area of angels, a great stadium of heavenly hosts, row after row above the throne room. As John said, 10,000 times 10,000. They were too numerous to count. The angels were falling on their face and echoing the words of the passing cherubim. Holy, holy, holy. Suddenly, the whole stadium and the throne room below were filled with the sounds of worship, glorifying God. Everything was active and responsive to prayer. 
Everything was coordinated, never chaotic, but orchestrated in constant motion. By the power of the name of Jesus, we have access to it all. Our prayers rise into his throne room and move and stir heaven. Heaven and earth are moved by the prayers of God's people in Jesus' name. Rick says, as quickly as the, the vision came, the episode came, it was over. He said, I found myself still kneeling at the same pew in the back of the mostly empty sanctuary. But I finally understood why he would one, why he said, God said he would one day destroy the heavens and the earth and why he would form new ones. He cannot destroy one without the other, no more than we can live with one and not the other. The heavens are his throne. The earth is his footstool. They are joined in prayer. And we are here right now in the throne room. When we pray, we take our proper place in that throne room. When we pray, we acknowledge where we are in the throne room. We have access to everything in heaven. By our prayers, you move heaven. By your prayers, Jesus moves and prays. Angels descend, saints bear witness, and God is about to do something new in our world. Prayer is the key, the beginning, yes, <laughs> the way forward. Amen and amen. Let's wrap this up. So it's never too late. It's never too late. The innkeeper missed the opportunity. Many do. No room here. No room in the inn. Jesus says, he knocks, right? Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Today, today we say yes. We'll come in. All you have to do is open the door. Come, Lord Jesus. My hope is in you. Because everything changes when we see the face of God. Katiana raised her hand to Yeshua. In those horrifying moments, she prayed, and God blinded the terrorist. They could not see the door handle. Do you need a miracle today? Something only God can do. Mary may have been the first to look in the face of God, but we too can look in his face. If you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, what would you do today? Would it change your behavior? Would it change your priorities? Then I say, do that. Do that. In many ways, we may need to reorder our life to make room for him. Prepare our hearts for Christmas. We must cultivate the spirit of expectancy. You cannot face a crisis if you don't face God first. Cling to him in the ER. When your dreams are falling apart, say to him, Lord, Lord, I need you now. Between the headstones and the cemetery, whisper, dear Jesus, be near to me, lift me up. When others are grumbling, may you be heard praying, God, you are good. I need you. Encourage me today. The prayer journal, King David, he wrote this question in Psalms 11. When all the good falls apart, what can people do? When terrorists attack, when disease rage, when families collapse and churches divide, when all good falls apart, what is the godly response of the unexpected calamities in our life? Curiously, David didn't answer his question with an answer he answered it with a declaration verse 4 the Lord is in his holy temple the Lord is on his throne in heaven his point is unmistakable when everything shakes God remains he is in his holy temple God's plan will not be derailed God is unaffected 
by our storms in our life, he remains unshaken. Today, I urge you to humble yourself before the one who humbled himself for you. Hope does grow here. Here, we discover God. If today you need to refresh and rededicate your life, make today the day. If you haven't bent your knee in a while, make today the day during altar where we just cry out to God. Prayer partners will be available or you can pray on your own, but don't leave today until you spend time with God. We develop our walk, we read, we pray, and then we do what God asks. We read the word. We know the word. We pray the word. Come, Lord Jesus, my hope is in you. Everything changes when we see the face of God. This is why I love Christmas. This is why we can celebrate with every light we see. Will you uh, bow your heads with me today? Worship team is coming. you bow your heads and close your eyes, I would like to ask you those questions. Is there anyone in this room that the words of this message has penetrated your heart and you know that God sees you exactly where you are today? Exactly where you are today. And you have yet in your life surrendered your heart to him? But you know today is the day. Thank you. Thank you. You want to raise your hand. Or perhaps you did know God once, but you walked away. And you say, today I rededicate my life to him. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those that have raised their hand this day. Lord, those that have humbled themselves before you. We cry out worthy. We cry out holy. You are God. You are Lord Almighty. You came to earth to save us. You love us. We are, our hope is in you. We thank you, Lord. Be with these, your people, today. Let us not grow weary. Let us not grow tired. Let us not step one step out of your will. But let us seek your face. Let us seek your word. God, would you put a deep desire, a hunger in our hearts for prayer? Would you put a deep desire to read your word and make your word come alive as we sit? Will you feast? We feast on your word. We don't have to strive. We don't have to struggle. You are ready and waiting to receive us. I thank you, Lord, for this time. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your faithfulness. God, I ask that you would bless our time of fellowship that would follow as we unite in community, Lord, as we strengthen each other, encourage each other, as we pray with each other, God. Be with your people um, this week as we move forward in your way. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.